All right, so we're going to talk about setting a strategy and developing your, your own weed management plan. And, and that's really important to think about in terms of an overall strategy. In terms of an outline, one of the things I want to focus on is catching problems when they're small. And so even in your, your uh, small acreage uh, place, you want, to, you want to be watching for things that are new so that you can catch those problems when they're small so that we can look at um, different strategies. One might be eradication. I'll go over what that is versus uh, uh, control. Uh, timing is somewhat Im important. Um, won't spend a lot of time working with that, but um, uh, one, of the, one of the issues that we run into when we're, when we're looking at um, a, uh, a control program, particularly if it involves a herbicide, is making sure that that you are applying that herbicide at the right growth stage of the, of the plant. And then uh, dealing with well-established weeds, and there's, um, there's a number of strategies that are possible. And we often look at that as, as an integrated approach within an integrated pest management uh, program. But um, one of the things that I wanna start with is, um, is a, is a little story for you. Um, and this is a lesson in dispersal. And so when we take a look at, at uh, plants and how they move around, this is really, uh, I think, a, a good way to look at it. And it comes out of a book that's called Timothy or Notes of an Ab Abject Reptile. And um, the way this book is written is it's written from the perspective of this tortoise. And um, Berlin Klinkenborg does a really nice job of, of um, of pretending he's a tortoise. Uh, so they, there's this tortoise and, and the tortoise's name is Timothy and, it, and Timothy has been missing for about two weeks. And, and these two boys find him and, and are running through the, the field, bringing it back to the person that own, owns the tortoise, which is Gilbert White. And um, within that two week period, Timothy had moved into an adjacent field and so uh, he hadn't moved very far, but he had he had he had gotten away, and so people were are somewhat puzzled by by how Timothy the tortoise as, actually escaped, and so they're asking, well, how did I escape? And uh, the first thing that Timothy says is, well, it helps if they leave the wicket gate open, so the the uh, the gate to the yard, and. Um, and so that was one of the factors that that helped with uh, Timothy's escape. And then, and then the other one is that um, Timothy makes this observation that humans are attracted to the quick. So he uses this example of um, of, of people who um, will go out and they they flash mirrors to startle these birds that are called swifts, and the swifts land in these nets, and then they take them. And, and take them to market. So the humans are attracted to the quick and they, they flash mirrors and catch swifts and nets. And Timothy says, however, I move through the holes in their consciousness. My slowness is deceptively fast. And this is really how we approach weed management. Um, the plants are moving more slowly and we don't recognize the developing problem because it's such a slow moving thing. And, and then, and then all of a sudden it approaches our, it, it comes onto our radar and we understand, oh, it is a problem. And the other thing that we do is we leave the wicket gate open. So we, uh, our wicket gates are things like roads. They might be where you park your RV. Um, there's a number of places where that wicket gate is open. And so these two concepts are really important for us as we look at trying to, um, build a strategy for weed management. This is how I like to look at, um, at invasion. So there's at some point in time early on, there's, there's a, um, an introductory phase. And, um, and that, that uh, introductory phase is, um, is right here where where we might introduce it into the US or it might be introduced onto your place. And that introduction could be in hay that is, that, that, uh, is contaminated. It could be 
uh, you went on a trip and brought something back. There's a, there's a number of ways in which that could be introdu introduced. Quite often there's a phase of time, and this is where we have our, our hole in our consciousness, and that's this lag phase where it doesn't look like it's actually increasing. Um, and and uh, that's really an important time where, where we really need to be focused, as mentioned earlier on with our, our weed ID, is, is to really look in this lag phase to find things when they're still at a point where we can actually get rid of them. Because you want to you want to look at at this earlier phase here, uh, and and so when we look at this area, we can look at something called eradication, and I'll mention show you that here in a minute. But quite often, where we are dealing with plants is at this stage right here, where through time they have basically infested most everything that they can, and then we're just looking at long term management. So depending on where your piece of property sits, it can really make a difference in just how, um, how easily invaded your area is. So the higher you are in elevation, the, uh, the lower the, the number of species that are gonna be a problem for you. That doesn't mean that there aren't species that are a problem for you. It just means that there, you have fewer plants to, to worry about. So um, if you were to take a look at areas that are susceptible to weeds coming in, our grasslands are gonna be much more invadable. And so as you go from a drier, uh, lower biomass site, increasing to something like this and into the forested areas, these are less susceptible to invasion when you get into these forested areas. And so just depending on where you sit on the landscape, that can really help to determine just how easily invaded your particular um, place is. The other thing that, that really plays into this is, um, is how, how many roads there are in your area. So if you're in a sparsely roaded area, so you don't have that many roads, then, um, then your risk level is lower. But if you are in an area that has a pretty high density of roads, then, then your, um, your risk increases. So if we look at road density, so this is the amount of roads in a given square area, and we look at the alien, this is a study that was done out of the country of Chile. Uh, you can see that the number of species is right here, and this is how dense the roads are. And what you can see is that there's a trend towards increasing uh, number of, of uh, non-native species as that road density increases. So if you, if you just happen to be in a highly roaded area, then you're gonna wanna spend additional time looking at, uh, at the ways into your place, and that could, could be the roadsides, to ensure that something new isn't coming in. This is just a, an example uh, of some work that, that we did where this is uh, alongside of a road. And, and this is done in, in situation where you don't have any, this would be a gravel road that has um, vegetation right up to the edge. It's not an improved road versus one that has a site distance. This might be more of a county road or, or a paved road. What we find is that in this instance, we have more more uh, roadside weeds than we do in this not improved. And then if we take a look at the roadside versus away from the road, when we're in a grassland situation, there's more of a link between what's on the roadside and what's off the road. So, so this is where we're combining two things, more roads and, and um, more of a grassland situation. This is the other extreme. This is a cedar hemlock, um, and this is a uh, basically a not improved road. But one of the things that you see where it doesn't matter whether it's not improved or an improved road, in both of these instances, there's almost no non-native species. This is what the percent of, uh, of the species that would be not native. And there's no non-native species out, out away from the road. So those help give you kind of some site uh, conditions where, where um, 
you are either more or less susceptible for something new coming in. Uh, and, and some of the other things that you wanna then uh, focus on is where do I look for something new? Well, one would be the, your, your driveway coming in, the, the road that might border your property. Those are places where you are more likely to find something new coming in. Uh, where you park an RV or where other vehicle parking is on your place, that's, that's another location. Uh, if, if you do have, uh, have livestock, it might be where you uh, work with those livestock. Um, that could be a place, um, particularly if, you're, if you've got hay as part of your, your, uh, your feeding of, of livestock, that hay could, could have um, a number of different weedy species within it. So it's, it's those types of areas that you wanna pay special attention to when, when you're looking for species that might be new to the area. So let's say you do find something that's new um, to your place. Uh, there's, a, there's a subset of control that's called eradication. And, and eradication is actually removing that plant from your property. And that means removing all plant parts um, and you continue that effort till even all the seeds are gone in the soil. Um, and, um, and so that process is usually several years. So quite often it's several years of control and then you watch the site uh, for several more years. And so some of the things you want to know, you want to know about that particular plant is that uh, you wanna know how do those seeds move for that particular plant? Are they windborne seeds or are they larger seeds that uh, really drop to the base of the plant? Uh, do they have hooks on them that allow them to move in, with animals? So those sorts of things give you clues in terms of how, how many different areas you may need to look on your place for those particular species. How long do those seeds last? Quite often we know that seeds may last anywhere from you know one or two years up to eight years, 12 years, sometimes uh, they're even longer lived than that. And then you wanna know, are there gonna be herbicides that are effective? And, and your weed superintendents can be really helpful in, in helping you determine that. And, and for some weeds, they can be pulled by hand. And, and uh, particularly if you have just a few of them on your place, pulling them by hand may, is likely gonna be one of the most successful ways of controlling them, particularly if they're annuals. And this is the reason why it's important if we take a look at the amount of effort that we have. So you can look at this hours of effort to try to get rid of something. And you could look at that either as hours or dollars, but you can see that you have a, from a low to a high investment. And as we go across here from something that's small to something that's much larger, you can see that that effort increases dramatically. So, so catching things when they're, smaller than an acre or just a few acres in size, those are really important periods of time in which to catch these. And, um, and even when you take a look at a 25 acres, that may even be bigger than what your, um, your small acreage uh, place is. But uh, on a county or regional wide basis, that's not a very big area. And so that's where our cooperative weed management um, programs are really important and, and they can be very helpful in, in uh, helping you to, to take care of things. If, if it's a little bit beyond what you think you can handle yourself, if it's a species that's um, an early detection rapid response species, you know, that, that uh, cooperative weed management area and that weed superintendent can be really helpful in dealing with it if it's something a little bigger. So let's say that you, were, you had a little patch, of, you found something new. So what you would do is you'd survey to make sure that you found the outer boundary of it. And then what you do is you treat the entire area plus a little bit of a border around it. And that border is determined by um, how far that particular plant can disperse. So if it was something like a leafy spurge, which can spit seeds up to 15 feet, then you'd wanna be sure that, that this border around it was 15 feet. Um, sometimes they don't need to be that big. But you treat the entire area in that first year. And what you'll find in, in that second year is within that same area, there may only be a, a few smaller patches, but it's really important to resist only spraying these and go ahead and spray that entire area again, because um, there are gonna be seeds in here and, and you may not 
have seen the one plant that's over here, you may have only seen these three patches. And so spraying that whole area helps you. And you might do that for two to three years. And then after that, then just go after the patches um, and continue to follow that up. And um, it really takes um, several different uh, uh, visits in a given year to, to actually eradicate. So you survey each year to see if there's any new patches. You can spray or pull plants. And uh, once you don't find any plants, you're probably surveying that area for another three years, and then hopefully you're going to be done. So that's the process for eradication. It's, it's uh, front end loaded in terms of a lot more effort, but um, it, it's uh, a lot less effort than it is dealing with something for the long term. So then you look at control, and that's going back to the same timeline. And here's um, here's our timeline. And so now we're looking at a situation where it's well distributed. And so we're looking at other strategies to help us. So when we get to a control level, you, you start thinking, well, which weeds are going to interfere with my goals? And when we're looking at a noxious weed, then part of your goal is going to be um, uh, complying with that noxious weed law. And so, so you're gonna you're gonna need to take a look at what category that weed is in so that you can figure out how you're gonna manage that. But um, quite often these these uh, plants interfere with other aspects of, of what we want to do with our our own uh, our, our own land. And so some of the questions are things like can I take care of several weeds at once? And there's a lot of uh, diversity in terms of herbicide choices that you might be looking at. So there are examples where, and um, Albert mentioned some of these, you can get things that are broader spectrum. So here's a one herbicide that has a number of different um, active ingredients in it and, it, and it does hit a broader spectrum of plants that are controlled. And then there are some that are more narrow in their spectrum. So things like the transline is a herbicide that, that um, still affects things in the sunflower family and also in the legume family, the bean family. Um, but there's a lot of plants that, that are not affected by it. Um, or fuselage, looking at grass herbicides where you were looking at annual grass control. So those are, um, those are some examples of narrow spectrum. And then there are some others that are what we call medium spectrum. And by spectrum, I mean the number of different kinds of plants that are controlled by, by that particular herbicide. So for example, transline and milestone are two different herbicides and, and they have different active ingredients, but they are related to each other. And um, uh, transline though has a narrower spectrum than milestone. So milestone would be what we would consider a medium spectrum herbicide. So it's really important. Uh, and I think both Albert and, and Pam uh, emphasize this, that you really need to be looking at those labels so that you know what kinds of uh, plants are actually controlled by that particular herbicide. So looking at integrated pest management. So there are different things that you might do. If you have livestock and you have a pasture as part of your place, um, looking at ma maintaining fertilization, um, looking at being sure that you are grazing that pasture properly to keep it healthy. In some instances, you might be able to utilize biocontrol and the cooperative weed management areas often have, um, have help for you in that where they, they will um, help you to locate where biocontrol agents are that you could move onto your place. But yeah, managing grazing, looking at reseeding in some instances, but do work with your county weed program because they can be very helpful in solving problems for you. Now I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of, um, of programs. And um, uh, this is one that uh, is from Northern Idaho. This is out by Sanders. It's a real small town in Northern Idaho. Uh, this is with Ventanata. What, what you see is this right here is all Ventanata and these small little sprigs that are sticking up. That's smooth brome. And smooth brome is a very competitive perennial grass, long-lived grass. And Ventanata is an annual, but you can see how suppressed the, uh, the, the smooth brome is. 
Here's where we have applied a herbicide. This was plateau at five ounces. And you can see that we've done a very nice job of, of removing it. And, um, and so when you look at the, the second year after, after we applied that, um, here's an area where we had applied it and here's where we did not apply it. You can see that the fentanyl is still really thick, but here we've, we've really turned that place around. And, and uh, this is 15 months after treatment and those grasses are about uh, three and a half to four feet tall. So it had gone from just an occasional sprig of smooth, smooth brome and the smooth brome had completely recovered. So that, and now just managing that properly with, uh, with grazing is, is what you wanna do. Um, in this particular instance, when we look at, at Ventnata, um, which is one of our problem annual grasses now, just wanna take you through this kind of busy slide of here's the, the amount of the ground that's covered by either the, uh, the annual grass Ventnata or the perennial grasses. And in most cases, it was smooth brome, but also had Idaho fescue and some others. So if we didn't treat it, here's, here's the Ventnata's, these first two bars, and here's the perennial grass. So you can see the perennial grass is suppressed. If we use a herbicide, this is one, this is a newer herbicide called Rejuva, which is useful for pastures and not crop areas. Um, but you can see it really reduced the, uh, the annual grasses and you can see the response in the perennial grasses. So this, this is true for a number of different herbicides. This is 16 months after, after it was treated. This herbicide called Matrix or in other places it's called Laramie or, or there's another product called Laramie. And uh, after 16, it, it does give you one year control, but after uh, 16 months, you can see that the annual grasses are coming back. Uh, the perennials are now starting to get suppressed again. Um, if you increase that rate from three ounces to four ounces, you can see that um, we're, we're looking at uh, still maintaining a little bit more of that grass at the Moscow site. So these are the kinds of things that, um, that we look at um, for control. So this is a herbicide that has a longer uh, life in the soil. And so it, we, we see it um, giving us longer term control than what the matrix is. So if we, so we would be looking at uh, utilizing some of those types of herbicides for that, but not a problem in a, in a pasture setting. But when we look at these, these uh, pastures and, and trying to maintain health, one of the things that you want to do with your strategy is to, is to really focus on keeping your, uh, your plant communities really healthy so that they are more resistant to weeds. So maintain your grass growth is really important. And you want to make sure that the number of animals that you have can be supported by the number of acres that you have. Uh, quite often, uh, people are, are putting out or, or they have too many animals based on the amount of acres that they have. And so then you end up with more and more weed problems because of that. So when we take a look at, you know, grasses are, are quite ubiquitous um, in, a, in a small small acreage land holding. And, and so knowing something about how grasses work is kind of important. So you have your, your stems here, you, you have a root system, and then some grasses have underground stems. So a smooth brome has underground stems that allow them to recover very well. Other grasses don't have those underground stems. And so they're much more, uh, much more slow to, re to uh, respond after the weeds have been removed. Uh, and then some grasses have a above ground stem also. So that's called a stolen. So these are rhizomes or stolons. Uh, then the other thing is, is that when you look at their growing points, some grasses have their growing points way up higher and some are much lower to the ground. And, and so that the ones that are up higher are more susceptible to grazing damage than those that are down low. The other thing is, is that grasses store their energy in the stems. They don't, they don't store them in the roots. So if you were looking at, at grazing in your pasture, if you can leave half of the vegetation, you'll maintain that root system and that'll help those plants be competitive against weeds. The more you remove from those plants, the less root mass you have. 
um, you can you can graze down to 70 percent so long as you only do it for a short amount of time and allow for regrowth so that before you get into the next year you're still in a situation where you got 50. but if you consistently mow, mow it basically with your livestock then you're reducing those roots and they just don't they don't regrow and and so then you end up with more and more weed problems one of our really good um, resources, and this one is free if you uh, download it, this will help you with pasture and grazing management. Um, it's a really good resource, so, so please take advantage of it. And the takeaway for us in this is you want to take half, leave half, but at the, at the very least, you want to leave about four inches of height on your stems in order to um, ensure that your grasses remain healthy. So that's one aspect of a, of a strategy for weed management is just to keep those healthy and proper fertilization. So that's with some of the annual grasses. Um, and, and this it's true for perennial grasses too. And, and we'll show you here with rush skeleton weed. This is, um, rush skeleton weed is a problem, particularly in, well, actually it's in Northern Idaho, Southern Idaho. It's, it's a problem across the, uh, the state and, and, uh, it looks a lot like dandelion. We mentioned earlier that uh, if it has all ray flowers, it'll also have the milky juice. And sure enough, it, this one does. Uh, it looks like dandelion when it's young. When it sends up its flowering stems, you'll see bristles. And these bristles are pointed back towards the base of the plant. And that's a really key char characteristic to knowing that you have brush skeleton weed. Brush skeleton weed does have some biocontrol agents that are really useful. And um, so this is a study that's looking at adding mites. So uh, there's a, a mite, it's a, uh, you have to have a, a, a pretty good microscope to actually see these individual mites. You can fit three of them on the end of a hair. That's how small they are. But what they do is they form these galls. And if you see these, uh, dark patches up here at the top of the plant. Those are all galls that the mites have, have uh, forced the plant to create, and that's the home in which they live. But the difference here is that you see how tall this plant is here, and look at how much smaller the plant is here. So what's going on here is that you don't have any competition right here, and so the rush skeleton weed is able to grow faster than the mites can colonize. Here, at the same number of mites, the, the uh, plants are stunted, and that's because they have competition. So the combination of a healthy grass stand plus biocontrol can really help to, to um, manage rush skeleton weed. I'm gonna throw another graph at you. Um, and so what we're seeing here, this is intermediate wheatgrass. So this is this is uh, not very much intermediate wheatgrass, and this is a lot of intermediate wheatgrass. And here's rush skeleton weed. So this is a lot of skeleton weed, and this is almost this is basically zero skeleton weed. What we find is as we increase the amount of wheatgrass in this instance, you see that there's a decrease in rush skeleton weed. And there's a point at which this goes from a steep curve to a shallow curve. And at that point, that's about 18% cover. And so we can actually, just using grass cover, perennial grass cover, if we can get 18% of the ground covered with, inter, with a grass like uh, wheatgrass, uh, and this is true for other grasses too, if you can get at least 18% of that ground covered, skeleton wheat goes from being a big problem to really not much of a problem. And that's, not, that's independent of having to use a herbicide. And this is just a uh, indication. All this area out here, um, outside of where this this these two lines are, these are all areas that are just absolutely inundated with with uh, rush skeleton weed. And this is where we came in and we planted um, wheat grasses. And um, this uh, this is now probably thirty years old, and it still looks good. Um, the skeleton weed is still on the outside and the perennial grasses are still doing well on the inside. And this is grazed down, this is winter range for um, mule deer and, and they, uh, they graze this down every fall. So um, 
it does get grazing pressure, but it's still it's still in good shape. So so that's uh, that's one of the uh, possibilities for uh, for looking at an integrated program. We're using biocontrol and plant competition. Occasionally, you could you may need to utilize a herbicide, um, but um, you wouldn't always. And then finally, another one: timing. Looking at timing with meadow hawkweed. Um, it's a it's a short statured plant, but boy, is it competitive. It, it has um, rhizomes, which are the underground stems. It also has stolons, which are above ground. And then it has flowers that uh, produce seeds that are windborne. So it, it has uh, pretty much every form of reproduction possible. And this is what it can look like. So this very short statured plant is able to outcompete these much larger grasses. Um, and this will just continue to expand if it's not controlled. So what we do is we look at um, utilizing herbicides. So this is M3 and M7 is milestone at three ounces or seven ounces. And this is transline. And um, uh, this is another herbicide that's not really available anymore. But you look at control here, um, here's, Here's our level of control of hawkweed. And when it is either at the rosette or the bolting stage, you can see that control is really good, virtually 100%. And even when it's flowering with this milestone, it's virtually 100% control. So really good control um, at either of these timings. What's interesting is that in the fall, after the plants are senesced, um, so they're not growing anymore, these herbicides don't work very well. And quite often with our perennial weeds, if we apply a herbicide in the fall, we still get good control, but that's not true with, with um, hawkweeds. We need to be looking at in season and not, and not out of season control. And this is looking at um, that same effect of application timing, but this is now on those grasses that have come back. And so you can see here, you can still see the response three years after treatment that if we sprayed it when those plants, when those um, hawkweed plants were bolting, we're getting the most production. Then here's where it was flowering, and here's where those herbicides were applied when that was senesced. And you can see that that we're getting really good um, pr production here compared to the check. So here we're still very suppressed with with the grasses where we didn't spray any herbicide. And this is just a really interesting photograph. So this is an area where we had applied the herbicide and we had also fertilized. And what you see is you see hawkweed all the way around it and virtually no hawkweed in here. And this was true even six years after application. Um, so once that hawkweed was removed, it really, even though it has rhizomes and stolons, it, it really has a hard time getting back into that stand. So this is really encouraging for us that, that there are instances where we can remove a, a plant, have a really good stand response, and then that's basically a solution, a one-time application. That herbicide, by the way, only lasts about six weeks. So this is not, this is not because of the herbicide, it's because of the, the, uh, the dynamics with the grass and, um, and there's some other things that are going on there, but we're not gonna get into that today. So I'm just going to close then, um, as, just to give you uh, some ideas. Doug had, wanted, had, had uh, asked that we look at some integrated programs, and so I just gave you three examples of that. And then another really good resource for you is weed control in natural areas in the Western United States. Um, this is a, a, a really good resource that a number of us contributed to. Um, and. Um, it is, uh, it, it is something that has uh, cultural controls, it has biocontrols, it has herbicides. Uh, it really allows you to develop your own weed management strategy uh, utilizing uh, a resource like this. And that brings me to the end of my presentation.